Today's sermon is entitled, All Bets on God. All bets are on God. This is Resurrection Sunday, and he wins for him, and he wins for us. So if he wins the battle, you see the gloves in the ring, it's going to be a knockout. When he wins, we win. Resurrection Sunday is a reminder of why we put all our investments in God. We place all of our marbles in the God bowl. We place all our bets on God. He is going to win. We do that because God is going to win. Somebody ought to say amen. When he wins for him, he wins for us. So you must understand that the battle he is fighting is a battle that he's going to win first and foremost for himself, that God is not a loser. God is a winner. And so when he wins for himself, he wins for us. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that we are in the middle of many wars right now on multiple fronts daily. Amen? We are fighting battles all the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're fighting familial battles, marital battles, parental battles, financial battles, racial battles, national battles, global battles, and it causes people to question their bets. When there's all this kind of fighting, you question what you're going to count on because it seems like you're not winning. Where should you rest your faith is the question this morning. Where should you rest your hope? Should you trust God or should you give up? There's so many things to fight. There's so many things to deal with. Do you trust God or do you give up? I came to remind you that all bets should still be on God. No matter what it looks like, and no matter how it seems the enemy is getting the best of you, no matter what they said, all bets are still on God. And here's why. Today, the current events suggest a lot is happening. There are wars in Ukraine, wars abroad, mass shootings. We just saw another one in Sacramento. I think there was another in South Carolina. Um, just people recently shooting up the uh, metro in, in New York, in Brooklyn. Uh, These gun laws, politicians are fighting about what is right, what's not right. We're fighting to protect our democracy. Uh, you know, some people, you know, changing the laws about how we vote and, uh, and, and, and trying to restrict the people of color in so many ways. And uh, we're fearing weapons of mass destruction and nuclear war and, and inflation goes up. We're fighting the pumps. We're fighting uh, the dollar at the stores. Um, then the plight of small businesses all of these things, all of these things are daily recurring fights. And with all of this, it looks like evil is winning. And this trouble isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So this message needs to hit home. Have you ever felt like, what's the point? I'm talking to people who wake up and seems like if it ain't one thing, it's another. Murphy's Law. 
the more you try, the worse it seems to get. Well, here's why today's message makes such a big difference. Let's look at Matthew 28, 18 to see who really is winning. And here's why. The text says, Matthew 28 and 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Look at the term, all authority has been given to me where? Heaven and earth. The point is, wherever there's a fight in Ukraine, South Carolina, Brooklyn, LA, Long Beach, wherever the drama is, God has authority in those regions and in those jurisdictions. And I want you to understand that these battles are not just facilitated by humans, but there are demons or spiritual warfare that are assigned to different regions. There are demons that are locked down on a particular corner where drugs may be sold or a liquor store on the corner where people get drunk. There are demons assigned to an area, a drug infested area, a prostitution area, a lying area. There are regions that the spiritual demons of darkness have some leverage on, but God has ultimate authority. And what Jesus was saying after the resurrection, this was in Matthew 28, he had just risen. He tells his disciples not to worry. Why? Because his resurrection demonstrated that he has the power over sin, over death and hell. His resurrection was a pre cursor of what is to come. In other words, the resurrection reminds us that when he got up, he was making a public statement. He was making public the authority that he had. And the next passage demonstrates that in Colossians 2.15. The text says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, look at that, disarm them. The powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, how? Triumphing over them by the cross. The cross demonstrates he's got the power. The reason the resurrection is important is because it establishes his authority. Jesus disarmed the powers and the authorities of the kingdom of darkness publicly and said when he overcame the cross, he overcame them. He overcame the cross by rising from the dead. If he didn't get up, then he doesn't have the authority. So the resurrection is important for establishing all bets are on God because God has all authority. But we know, watch this now, God has all authority, but the truth is that powers and principalities are still at work. There are people still strung out on drugs out there. There are people still fighting. There are couples at each other's throat this morning. Couldn't even get to Resurrection Sunday. But the key here is, Lou and the Grizz, is that they are working without the authority to do so. The devils are doing dirt without the authority to do so. They are being allowed by God but just because you're allowed doesn't give you authority. But they don't have the authority to make the actions okay. That's what I'm trying to get you to see, that when you have authority, what you do is okay. Uh, so when we talk about acting, 
acting this year, when we talk about being people of action, we need to be people who have the authority to do what we do, so it's okay. What the devil is doing, he's doing it, but it's not okay, which means it is not giving him the authority to do it. Wherever there is authority to do it, that means it's okay to, oh, come on, somebody go with me. So again, God is allowing this period to give people a chance to choose him, not just because things are great in their lives, but when things are at their worst. So God is allowing the devil to do something that is wrong and it is not okay, but he's doing it because he wants to give people a chance to choose the right way. So when things are at their worst, God still wants you to choose the best. When you can choose, listen to this, this is important, little been when you can choose someone or something when they are at their worst that's real love loving someone who is perfect is effortless love you don't have to work at that there is no work when you have to love someone who is perfect so God withholds because this is not a perfect place and he wants people who are imperfect to choose him and at their worst, as Romans tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, in our worst pitiful state, Jesus said, I'll lay down my life for you. In other words, actions like that make you choose him. People have the choice to choose him or not. Take advantage of the time, people, that you have to choose because once someone exercises their authority to finalize the conflict, your choice is gone. In other words, by the time you're born, gets ready to fire you. He's given you time to make a choice to get it together. But once your boss sends you the pink slip and says, by the authority of me being the CEO, you're fired, you have lost your choice. So I don't see the evil in the world as a bad thing so much because it gives people an opportunity to choose heaven over hell. God, I wish somebody knew what I was talking about. And it's the authority. It's the one with the authority to end it who has the advantage. God can pull the trigger at any moment if he wants to, but he's given people a chance to choose. Tap your neighbor and say, you got a chance to choose, honey. The resurrection gives him that authority. I'm going somewhere. Stay with me. I'm setting up the platform. But what good is the authority, Tony, if nothing happens? What good is God's authority, me knowing he rose from the cross, if I'm still having trouble on the job? I still can't pay my bills. What good is his authority? Well, I'm glad you asked because I got an answer. The gospel story of the cross and the resurrection is where the authority is established. But the book of Revelation is where the action takes place. I'm going to say that again. I went too fast. Uh, the gospel story that we read about, about the cross and the resurrection, that's where the authority is established. But the book of Revelation, when we go there in a minute, is where the action takes place. Somebody say action. Authority is about being positioned to do something and it's okay. So Jesus is positioned to act on your behalf to help you with your finances, to help you with your marriage, to help you with the pain in your body, to help you with your unsaved soul. Action, watch this, his authority positions him. The action 
action is about doing something with the authority you have, which makes it right. So the book of Revelation is about the authority happening. Somebody say happening. Say happening, Wendy. Oh, what's up, Rashad? My man, my man. I love him. It's the final war. So Revelation is about the revelation. It's about the happening. It's the payback. It's the final war. It's when God gets the last laugh. It is the battle of Armageddon. Why should such a future event affect us on Resurrection Sunday today? I'm glad y'all asking so many questions. This is so good. Why should a future battle of Armageddon help me today? Well, it should impact our attitudes today because we know that whatever wrong anyone is doing to us right now or any of God's people, they ain't gonna get away with it. So you can walk around LA or walk around Texas or wherever you are with a little smirk on your face to say to the devil, you may have won the battle, but you will not win the war. So I'm gonna shine and I'm going to testify that you aren't going to get away with it. The battle, ah oh God, the resurrection is important to remind all of us that the devil ain't going to get away with it. I lost my house, but the devil ain't going to get away with it. I had to go through a divorce, but the devil ain't going to get away with it. My friend went to jail, but the devil ain't going to get away with it. Somebody lied on me and tarnished my reputation, but the devil ain't gonna get away with it. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. But what was it that sealed the deal? What was it that sealed this deal? How can we know this, Riri? How can we know that this is true? How can I be confident, Yanisha, that God is the authority and the devil is not gonna get away with it? Well, there are two things, and it's called the cross and the empty tomb. This is your qualifier. The cross and the empty tomb is your evidence that God has the authority and that the devil ain't gonna get away with it. The cross and the empty tomb is the contract signing for the battle of Armageddon. <laughs> what the cross and the empty tomb says, it says Jesus signed on the dotted line. I kicked your butt here and I will kick your butt in the end. What Jesus did on the cross and the resurrection is serve the devil a notice. He said, I've got more power than you. Act a fool if you want to, but I will be back. So God is saying at the cross and the empty tomb, I have beaten you once, I will finish the job. So it would be wise of you, Lucifer, Beelzebub, devil, Satan, or whoever you got working for you, it would be wise of you to take note on this day to make some changes so you don't have to deal with me when I come back. Can I just preach to some of you who are given the opportunity to change your ways so you don't have to deal with the judgment of God in the latter days? God is giving you you an opportunity to make some adjustments, boo. You better get it together. You, come on, come on, Horatio, Rashad, you and your little homies, you and your, your kids, Riri, you gotta make some changes. I know it feels right to be cool, but let me tell you something, ain't nobody gonna be cool in hell. Ain't nobody gonna be cool when the devil is all upside their head. And that's what salvation is all about. It's about getting on the right side of the law, getting on the side of the one with the authority to protect us from all evil. Haven't you ever seen how the small people run and hide behind the big bulky people? That's what salvation does. It says, get behind me. I got you covered. So yes, God is a God of love, but any God worth their title has to be able to execute judgment. I don't want
want no wimpy God who can't fight. I don't want a God who's just a lamb. I need a God to be a lion too. He is the finality of all the laws and the rules. God defines the parameters of what winning is. I remember when we used to play football in the street, Mama Kane, we used to play football in the street and we had to set up where the goal line was. In other words, if whoever passes the second street light, that's a touchdown. Well, what I'm saying is God determines where the winning line is. God establishes how and where you win. So God moves the goalposts. If he thinks you don't have the strength to make it, he can move the goalposts closer and say you still gonna win. For those of you who are thinking that it's too late for you to do something for God, he can still move the goalposts closer to you so that you can still make it and you 70. <laughs> you can be 60 and still cross the line and be first in place. <laughs> so I want you to understand he's got the authority to do that. He determines what winning is. So let's look forward to what the resurrection has given license to occur in the final war, the battle of Armageddon. I think you will enjoy this. Let's turn to Revelation 19. We'll look at verses 11 through 21 and let's see who you are willing to bet on this morning. Get your bets ready, boo. Who are you willing to cast your bet on by looking at the two armies that are going to be fighting? I want to introduce to you over in the right corner is going to be the army of God. Over in the left corner is going to be the army of Satan. And as the great referee used to say, let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> let's look at the scripture here. The text says we want to look at God's army first and look at the gloves in the ring. Jesus first came as a servant and a lamb. He came to announce peace, to give people a chance to choose the right way. But his second coming will be as a lion, a mighty and powerful ruler who brings finality to the previous period of grace. The army consists of, this is the army. I want you to listen to this. The army is Christ. The army, everybody on God's side, the army is Christ. The army is the Old Testament saints, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and Noah. They in the army. The believers that came out of Israel, they're in the army. The church, everybody who came to Jesus through the church, they're in the army. The tribulation saints, those who got saved, who refused the mark of the beast, 666, they get saved. The angels. They're in the army. I'm telling you, this army is bad. So when I look at the roster, when I've been looking at the NBA playoffs, they put the starting lineup up there. The starting lineup, starting at center, Jesus, forward, God, next forward, the angels, point guards, the church, the saints, the Israel, the believers. He's not coming on a donkey this time. He's coming on a white horse, and his eyes are not filled with tears, but they fill with fire. They're not a crown of thorns, but they're crowns with diadems. He's not stripped and beaten, but he's clothed in a garment dipped in blood. Let's look at the text here, and the text will explain it itself. The text says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness, here it is, he judges, and he makes war. Oh, it's about to go down. John's vision of future things, we're being told how things are going to turn out. So first thing I want you to notice in verse 11, that the heavens were opened. Here's what I want you to picture, that the heavens opened. You're going to know it's time for God to make sure the devil pays. That's why I call it the great payback, that the heavens are going to open. All you got to do is look up. All you got to do is be able to see that the heavens open. Picture heaven opening and the army of Christ is about to invade earth. Anybody ever see Avengers? 
Did you see the Avengers, uh, Lawanda? Did you see how when Tony Stark or, or Iron Man and all of them and Captain America were fighting and then the heavens opened up and those metal machines, worm looking like things came out of heaven? That's a straight picture. They borrowed it from the Battle of Armageddon. Somebody been reading Revelation. Movie makers been reading Revelation, boo. All it is saying is that the heavens open and the armies come down. The difference is it's not the devil army coming down is God's army. So the sky opens up and he unleashes on hell. He's coming down to earth to make sure the devil pays for what he did to you. <laughs> well, once again, the enemy was just trying, when you look at those movies, the enemy is trying to replicate what God is going to do. So the Bible says, put the scripture back up for me. Verse 11 says, heaven was open and he was on a white horse. His name was faithful and and true and he came to make war so check this out when the heavens open what you're gonna see is Jesus on the white horse he's leading the army come on Jesus you better tell you better tell him you're not on the cross you're not broken down you're not in a tomb this time but you're on a white horse a stallion and your name is faithful and true why is it faithful and true because he's saying I told you I was gonna handle it <laughs> that's why his name is faithful and true, Starla, because he comes to say, I got this. I got this, Tia. Joyce, he's saying, I'm coming to handle every wrong that's been dealt you in your life. And the Bible says he is the righteous judge. He is the righteous judge, and he comes to make war. Remember I said it's righteous because he has the authority to do it. So it's okay for him to kick the devil's butt. Ain't nobody gonna stop him. Can't no police stop him. Ain't no God, ain't no spirit that could stop him. He's got the right to do <laughs> He's got the right to come kick some butt. <laughs> Look at verse number 12. Let me show you verse number 12 says, his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. So yes, he's called faithful and true in one place, but there's a name that some people don't even know. <laughs> they don't even know what his name is. In other words, he's mysterious. <laughs> so his eyes are like flame of fire. In other words, the scrutinies of his gaze, his scrutinizing and gaze has the power. His He has the power to look at you and you can burn up. He's coming. Oh, I'm telling you, this ain't no pamby, mamby, pamby, Jesus. Oh, uh, 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 forgive them, Father. For No, 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 no. This is the payback for every time the devil lied on you, every time he stole your money, every time he broke up your relationship, every time he messed with your kids, every time he took your job, every time he foreclosed on your house, everything that's happening negative I want you to keep a tally. I want somebody to write on their paper. This is what the devil did. This is what the devil did. This is what went wrong. This is what went wrong. One day, Jesus is going to come back. And when he comes, he's got his eyes of fire, which means he sees it all. That's what he said. Ain't nothing, ain't nothing getting away. Ain't nothing getting by God. He says he has a name that no man knew. But look at verse 13. Got to keep it moving. Verse 13 says he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. Doggone, he dropping names. He just dropping names, faithful and true, a name nobody knows, and he's called the word of God. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Let me talk to you about the robe. Here's the robe. Remember, remember the blood. The blood was on his robe because they beat him, they whipped him, they scorned him, they pierced him in the side when he was on the cross. But now, watch this now, this blood is not necessarily the blood from his body, but it's the blood represented on the vesture that he's about to do war. In other words, this blood symbolizes I am not coming to be your friend. I came to be your friend a long time ago. That Remember, remember when, remember when people come to you as a friend, they are allowing you the choice to choose. But when people call it, when people say I'm done, when people say I'm through, in other words, your choice is gone. So Jesus' second coming is saying your choice is gone. And why do they call him the word of God? Because the word of God gave you the opportunity to choose me. You chose not to. So now I'm 
I'm showing you that the word was made flesh. I'm still alive. You thought you killed me. All these years have passed. I'm still on the throne, boo, and I'm about to handle my business. So the word of God became flesh so he could still fight for you. The spirit don't need to fight man. He's fighting man to man. Look at verse 14. Got to keep it moving. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen. Uh Uh-oh, wait a minute. His robe is fine, but it's dipped in blood. Our robe is fine, but it's white and clean. Guess who's following him on white horses? That's me. That's Joy. That's Shauna. That's CY. That's Mama Kane. That's Lil Ben. That's Lou. That's Grizz. That's everyone who has accepted the blood of Jesus on their life. Everyone who is covered by the blood is in the army and his crimson blood has made their linen white. Woo! That's the power of his blood. You think Tide is good. (laughs) You think your detergent is good. The blood is good. The blood releases every stain in your life. So not only does he come to rectify the wrongs done to you, he also has rectified the wrongs done in you. (laughs) The sin that destroyed you, Jesus satisfies that. But now he's got to whoop some butt on the person who made it responsible for your sin. The devil was the serpent who convinced Eve and Adam to eat the fruit, and he's got to pay. Jesus is coming back to say, for everything you did to Adam and Eve, I'm about to give you some act right. Anybody know what act right is? Remember from the biker boys? So he comes, and he is the word of God, and we're followed uh, in the army in white linen and guess what we own white horses too put the scripture back up as 14 ends we follow him on white horses but look at 15 he says but he alone Verse 15 says, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. So not only he's going to strike them, but he's going to rule them. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty God. In other words, he alone is going to fight with a sharp sword that's going to come out of his mouth. He's going to strike the nations. In other words, the power of his word are going to kick the butt of the devil. So he alone would fight. The sword from his mouth is to smite the nations. Watch this. Not only smite the nations, but he also will rule over them. And then the Bible says he would tread upon them like a treader in a wine press, crushes grapes out of fierceness and the wrath of God. The text says he will tread the wine press of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty God. In other words, he's going to step all over the devil. He's going to trample on the enemy forever everything the enemy has done, for everything the enemy has broken, for everything the enemy has stolen. He says, I'm going to stomp the grape out of it. <laughs> I'm still going to tell you what I was going to say. But he said, I'm going to stomp it out of the devil. I want you to know that I'm not coming to play cards with the devil. I'm not coming to sign a peace treaty. I'm not coming to give him another opportunity. I'm coming to make choice go away. The choice is done. You had an opportunity. This is the period of grace. Pastor Cherry set up the grace place. You didn't come. He set up grace horizon. You didn't come. You said he set up breath for change and you didn't come to Jesus still. You had a choice. Ah, God, I feel Jesus now. So here then the text says he's coming in wrath. But look at verse 16. It says, and he has on his robe. Oh, snap, Joy. Here's another name on his thigh, a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He like dropping them names, boy. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In other words, there ain't no king on earth who's larger than him. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. Anybody who got the name Lord in front of their name, he's the Lord of them. Anybody who says they're King of anywhere, he's the King of them. So he says then in verse 16, he comes and his robe is written on it, King. In other words, I want you to know, here's my name tag. When I'm coming, look at me, and you'll see King of Kings and Lord. Who is that coming? 
coming through the heavens, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But look at 17 and 18. It says, then I saw an angel standing in the sun. Oh, snap. So Jesus is coming out of the earth, coming out of heaven on a white horse. And then he sees an angel standing in the sun, in the sun. An angel has the power to stand in the sun while Jesus is riding on the horse. And he cries out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds, oh, 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 oh making the bird call. He's calling twit, 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 twit. The, the angel is saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. It's about to be a slay session. Oh, Beyonce slays, but Jesus slays greater. So look at verse 18. 18 says then that you may eat the flesh of kings. Come on, birds. I want you to eat. I want you to have supper. Eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of cats the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Jesus is saying, angels cry out to the fowls in the air, come and eat the carcasses of your enemy. Your demise is done. Every king who did wrong, dead. Every captain who did wrong, dead. Every mighty man who robbed, cheated on their taxes, stole, did things things that were wrong and wasn't saved under the blood of Christ, dead, and even their horses, dead, even their banks and their empires, dead, gone, horses, gone, I don't care whether you bond or whether you free, when this fight goes down, your title don't matter, boo, you about to be toe up, so small or great, you gonna lose, all bets are on God, why, 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 little Ben, because he beat them before at the cross and the resurrection. So all bets are on God because he's already demonstrated that he's got the power to do this. He's beaten them before and he'll beat them again. And the evidence is the cross and the empty tomb. Now, let's wrap this up as we look at the opposition. That was God's army. Let's look at Satan's little old army. Let's see what he working with. What you working with, Slewfoot? What I want you to envision is an army gathering to make their last and final stand against Christ and all that is good. This is the last ditch effort of the enemy trying to save face. I want you to see like you would on TV, tanks and weaponry gathering to a place in this case, it's going to be actually Megiddo. This will be a real war on earth. In Ukraine, I remember looking at TV and they showed how Russia had miles and miles of a convoy that was positioning itself to attack Ukraine. I want you to literally see that there's going to be an army of the enemy with miles and miles of weaponry, a convoy that is coming to Megiddo, a place in the east that they are going to try to fight God. You dummy, you lost already, but the devil is going to try his last fight. And this is how God's arch enemy will bring everything he has to fight with God. The Bible even says in the previous chapters of Revelation, that God is going to clear up pathways so the convoy can get through. He wants to make sure the devil and everybody, God is saying, bring everybody you want to the party because they going to die too. He says, needless to say, it's going to be a quick fight and it ain't going to last long. I'm going to let you travel thousands of miles to get here, take you hours to get here for a fight that's going to last minutes. Have you ever paid hundreds of dollars for a ticket at the boxing match and the match is over in 10 seconds? Oh, it's a horrible feeling, but not in this case, because here's who's fighting on Team 2. Let's look at the lineup on Team 2. We saw the lineup of God. Here is the lineup on Team 2. The Antichrist, the Beast, the, the human representation of of Satan, the Antichrist, false prophet, 
is going to be on there. The kings of the east. So anybody on the east, the Middle East, all of those rulers, presidents, kings, prime ministers, anybody who rules in those areas that are not under the blood of Christ. Well, these are people who are going to still be here. So anybody still here, the rapture will have taken place. So anybody still here, you can pretty much guess you on the other team. <laughs> So the kings of the east and the possibly Egypt, the Russian Federation of Europe, uh, people with, watch this, people with the mark of the beast, 666, those are all going to be there. And guess who else is going to be there? Satan himself is going to be looking and watching and trying to fight against God. I want you to understand the final war depicts the destiny of the saved and the unsaved. This is the final war where God God steps up on your behalf and says, this is why I came. Winning is putting things in their right places. Jesus said, I came to coordinate. I came to put stuff in its place. And so even now, it seems like a time where God is okay with things not being in order. It seems like God is okay with the devil harassing your family. It seems like God is is okay with allowing the courts to do what they do to you. It seems like God is okay with your family attacking you the way they are. It seems like God is saying it's okay, but why? Because this allows people the freedom to choose the right way. God is not stepping in because he wants people in your family to choose God for who he is. He wants people people who used to abuse you and take advantage of you. He's still giving them a chance to save, get saved by the blood of Jesus. I know you're mad. I know you want them dead, but Jesus came to save the whole world. And so it may look like God don't care about what they did to you. I came to remind you that revelation is the reminder that they ain't going to get away with it. Anybody who did wrong with you and refuses to apologize and refuses to give their heart to Jesus for the life they live wrong, they will pay one day. It is out of order now because he has allowed it to be out of order and it's out of order because people keep choosing the wrong thing. Every time they put somebody in jail, somebody else acts up. Sometimes every time somebody shoots over here, somebody shoots over there. I'm telling you, the cycle repeats itself and I want you to understand it is not it does not mean that God doesn't care it means that God has given people an opportunity to choose the God ain't that a God ain't that a God who just doesn't come over and just rack you over the head he still gives the liar and the cheater the fornicator the, the criminal a chance to get saved and it says it will always be out of sync until God writes the ship and I came to tell you he's going to write the ship at the battle of Armageddon but what he gives us during this time is grace somebody say grace isn't it a coincidence that I'm preaching about war and my nemesis jumps online named Charles I'm gonna tell you the battle is over boy you're gonna lose he covers us with grace he gives us grace even though the devil is racking us and jiving us and a fresh Frustrating us, God gives us grace. He told Paul, when Paul prayed three times, take this thorn from me, Jesus said, I'm not going to take it away. My grace is sufficient for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I'm preaching now. So we got to go through whatever we got to go through, but we don't go through it without the grace of God. Somebody say, thank you for your grace. We must go through it. But we still must keep what? All bets on God. Somebody type it on the line. All 
bets on God. Why? Because it's going to be corrected. It will never be right here on earth until he comes again. Also, I preach this to let the unbeliever know that it's not a pretty sight for them in the end. If you're listening and you aren't saved, it ain't going to be pretty for you at the final day. No one talks about it now, but it will be bad in the outcome in the end. And they should be reminded. Let me look right in the camera and tell somebody, hell is real. Hell is a real place. Hell, the lake of fire is a real place. God is undoing the curse of sin. He is restoring mankind to his original state of being. He is made in the image of God. I wasn't made like this. I wasn't made to live with cancer. I wasn't made to live with leukemia. I wasn't made to live with lupus. I wasn't made to file bankruptcy. I wasn't made to be unhealthy. I wasn't made to go through emotional scars from breakup after breakup. I was made in the image of God. And one day God is going to fix this. God is going to make it all right. So let's see their positioning in our final scripture today in Revelation 19 verses 19 through 21. Let's see what the, what the army of the devil did. He said, and I saw the beast the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Woo, look at this now. They gathered together. Christ opened the heavens for Satan. They gathered on earth. Now remember, God has the authority over both realms. God has authority over both heaven and earth. He said, I open up heaven, but gather if you want to. The enemy's army, the beast, the false prophet, the kings, all of them were gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse as if they had a chance, Shana. They didn't win on Calvary, and you ain't gonna win today. The previous chapters tell us that they have already lost. So notice in verse 19, it goes from gathering to being thrown in the fire. I told you it would be quick. He says, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, the armies gather together. But look at the next verse. It says, then the beast was captured with him, the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Underline this sentence. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. <laughs> Let me just break this down for you for a minute. The priest and the false prophet were immediately taken and thrown into the lake of fire. In other words, he went straight for the captains. He didn't start with the little people. He said, let me start with the ones who started this stuff in the first place. Let me get the Antichrist. And I want somebody to know that the Antichrist will be a, a literal human being who lives on the earth, who possesses his great spiritual power. The beast and the false prophet will deceive the nations. In other words, they'll keep talking about fraud and false prophets and false rules and laws and deceiving people. It don't mean that. This is really the truth. Just like the serpent deceived Adam and Eve, this is what they do. The chicanery they do. They were capable of miracles and great deception. But God said, let me get you out of the way because ain't going to be no deceiving in this fight. They were clearly of a different nature, but they were of human members of the army. I want you to understand that the Antichrist and the false prophet were human beings in the army at Megiddo, and they will be thrown into the lake of fire. God had separate plans for the big wigs of the satanic army. Satan himself would not be immediately destroyed. In other words, even Satan, he throws him in the pit for, in the abyss for a 
thousand years. So the beast and the false prophet go to the lake of fire. They go to the final place. But Satan, he goes to the abyss, which is not the lake of fire, but he's in chains for a thousand years. God said, I got so much authority. I could throw you in the lake of fire, but I'm just going to lock you up for a thousand years so you can watch me rule over the place that you thought you had the power over. So the rest were slain. Look at the text. The text says then in the next verse, he says in 21, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. The rest of the folk got ate up. So watch this, y'all. Beast, plop, false prophet, plop. Everybody else who's on horses, manning tanks, sitting in airplanes, getting ready to shoot a missile. Everybody else who was left, what did the Bible say? They were slain and crushed. And guess what? Birds came. Come on and eat, y'all. Come on, eagle. Come on, Chi Chi. Come on, bluebird. Come on, cockatiel. Come on, feather one. Eat upon the enemy. I want you to know that the birds are going to eat the devils that hurt you. The birds are going to eat the, the spirits that took advantage of you. So the Bible said in verse 17, as the angel said that they were standing there telling all the birds. So he just said, woo, 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 woo. come and eat, come and eat, dinner is served. <laughs> it didn't take long. How long did it take? Beast, false prophet in the lake. And then the scripture just says, everybody else is dead. <laughs> it don't even talk about a fight. It doesn't even talk about an hour they fought for an hour. No, Jesus opened his mouth and everybody just was crushed. Blood everywhere. They didn't bow to the word when they had a chance. What I'm getting to see, they had a chance to bow to the word, but now the word is bowing them, is crushing them. In other words, the word comes, he speaks as the sword out of his mouth and just crushes them. With the word of God, he says, the word you wouldn't obey is the word you gonna crush. What I'm, what's gonna crush you? In other words, I'm telling you, take advantage of the opportunity you have for peace. Take advantage of the time that God gives you to negotiate, because when it's time, the thing that you reject is the thing that's going to destroy you. You think that you got God beat and you're so smart. I'm telling you, you got to see his way, see his out for you. He's giving you a chance. I know the contract is not everything you wanted, but it's got most of the stuff you want. So now choose it, sign off on it. In other words, do the deal. Make sure that you're in a place. Don't be scared. Flesh is no match for God and they will be instantly killed. I wish a flesh, a human would try to stand up to God. Yeah, that, well, I want you to get to see, get you to see this, that the word of God crushed flesh. The word of God crushed flesh. I'm telling you, your flesh is no match for the word of God. So when you pick up the word of God, whoo, when you read the word of God, that word has the same power to destroy you. But now you're in a period of grace. So the same word that can destroy you is now the word that's offering you life and peace is on this morning preaching to you, asking you to choose life while you have a chance. The Bible says there will be blood that is high as a horse's bridle. The blood on the earth will be as high as a horse's bridle across the earth. That's how bad the battle is going to be. Wow. So let me conclude this section. I'm out of time, but here it is. Place your bets. It's my final thought. All bets are on. Come on. Come on. All bets on God. Pull your wallet out. Pull your money out. Pull your heart out. Where's your bet? Pull your hope out. Pull your, pull your spirit out. Who are you going to choose today? So if I had to put my money on anyone. All my bets are on God. Line up whatever it is you're going through and lay it at the altar this morning. All bets are on God. He is proven by the cross and he is proven by the resurrection that this is doable because he's done it before. God is going to take care of the enemy in the last day, but he has shown at the resurrection that he has the authority to do it. And he's sending a clear message to
to all who oppose him. You have a chance to change now. If not, you will pay big time. You ought to tell the devil, your day is coming. You got me crying today, but your day is coming. You got me stressed out and anxieties, but your day is coming. He's reassuring. Jesus is reassuring all of those who love him and have chosen to believe and follow him that there isn't a devil in hell on earth that will do anything to hurt you and not have to pay for it. He wants you to know God has got your back. Our God is basically saying to us, I will fight your battles. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. I'm here to kick sin's butt, death's butt, hell's butt, the devil's butt, all the demon's butt, and any other butt that gets in your way. I'm here to set in order. And the way you butt a butt is when your butt acts a butt, you just say, but God. Whenever the butt of the devil shows his butt, you say, but God. Your response to the butt is but. Your response to the devil's butt is but God. So be encouraged this Resurrection Sunday. God's delay of punishment in our lives is a chance to choose peace. It is a chance to negotiate for a different outcome. Listen, if the truth be told, whatever you asking God to fix or correct, you haven't been 100 perfect in it either. So if he's going to crush them, he ought to crush you. So you ought to thank God for not crushing them because if he was just across the board, there is no favoritism to you and favoritism to them. You both are recipients of grace and you ought to be glad that he hasn't crushed them because it's given you time to get your hort together. You got to get your own hort together. Your hort. You got to get your life together. And so while you crying, talking about why the devil, why God won't do something with them because God is saying I'm giving time for you to do something with yourself. So if you come to the table and just admit your faults today and be honest and express your dependence on him, he will spare you much heartache. Just be real with yourself. God, thank you. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that you haven't come back already because it sure would have had me in a bad spot. You're giving me time to negotiate peace. That's why we pray, Lord, forgive me of my debts as I forgive those who have sinned against me. That's what prayer is. We're negotiating peace with God. And so many times we hide and we lie to protect ourselves. I didn't do nothing wrong. I didn't, it's their fault. Everybody's fault but yours. I guarantee you there isn't a situation you're facing that you don't have some percentage of fault in it. Everybody has fallen short of the, the righteousness of God. So when you are honest and you tell the truth, Jesus becomes your protection. When the only true protection is your own, is your own vulnerability, you will find restoration with yourself and with God. So don't take your silence for denial. Take it as a sign for a time of correction. It is a time to choose. So this Resurrection Sunday, y'all, I'm glad my bet is on God. God will pay off. My bet, not BET, the TV, TV show, but your bet is on God. When, I, when Joy and I go to Vegas, we don't bet. We don't gamble. Why? Because we don't like to lose. <laughs> and we already strapped up there in the first place. We ain't got no money to be rolling on the table for the dealer to take. You can't take my 20. That's all I got. That's for dinner tonight. My dad used to take me to the racetrack me and some of the kids sometimes. We go to the racetrack with daddy and sometimes I remember the horse he liked was called Secretariat and daddy with his big old belly, he'd be standing, come on Secretariat, come on. <laughs> he would say, come on Secretariat. And when Secretariat didn't win, he would be like, oh shoot. And he'd have to go back and change his bet. But in God's case, Secretariat always wins. My point is, with God, Jesus always wins. With betting on Secretariat, you 
may win, you may lose. My daddy lost most of the time because we weren't rich. We didn't get rich off of gambling. But when you put your bets on God, you will always see God cross the finish line winning. With God, you win. All bets are on God. Always cash in. The odds are too much in your favor. You would be stupid not to choose him today. If not today, tomorrow, he will win. He always does what he says he will do. And when he wins for him, he wins for us. So thank you, God, for winning. And thank you for winning for us on this Resurrection Sunday. In Jesus' name, I'm PC. And that's all. I've got happy Resurrection Sunday. Now go cast your bets. Peace.